Well, welcome to the, our class today. Uh, under the broad subject, you can see on the top of your paper, uh, we're talking about evangelism, but I like to use the words, share your faith. Um, because that's really what most of us are interested in doing is sharing our faith. And uh, so I want to try and help you, if at all possible, to make you more comfortable in doing that, give you a few ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Hopefully at the end of class time, we'll have some time for you to practice on one another. <laughs> Won't that be fun? <laughs> but before we get started, let's pray. Father, we thank you for our Bible Institute here at the church, and I pray that today, as we delve into your word and look into the truths that are found in it and how we can clearly tell others about those truths, I pray that you would encourage us, that you would strengthen us. Um, Father, give us a boldness to be able to share our faith. Father, we're going to be learning about telling our story, but really we're telling your story also. We're telling about the one who came, the one you sent, Jesus Christ, and uh, what he accomplished for us. And gave us a, a life that is meaningful and, and worth living. So, Father, as we look into all these different things, again, you, uh, through your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help us to understand these things and to uh, apply them to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, the very first thing I would like to do for you is for you to watch the screen. I know it's hard for you over here. I'm going to back up a little bit, but I, I would like you to stay absolutely quiet until we're done. Do you realize in the United States, 60 people just died and entered into eternity? Some of them you may have known. Some of them you probably don't even know. Some of them you could have met and never talked to. The urgency of sharing our faith is that eternity is one heartbeat away. We need to be able to share our faith whenever the Holy Spirit prompts us to do that, whenever we find ourselves in a situation that we're able to do something like that. Because eternity is that close. So that statistic again, two people die in the United States every single second of the day. Isn't that amazing? Um, we need to do what the Bible tells us, redeem the time. We need to uh, make good use of our time. The Bible also reminds us that now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And so we want to be able to share our faith. So I'm here this morning to help you in any way I can to be able to do that more effectively or easier for you. And uh, any time through any of this, if you have questions, don't be afraid to shout out, raise a hand, whatever, and uh, I'll, I'll see if I can answer your questions for you. But sharing your faith. Look at your verse at the bottom. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Now notice the picture. What is that a picture of? A lighthouse. We're the light of the world. We need to be shining. What good does it do if a lighthouse isn't shining? It, 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 ships run into the rocks, right? Well, we need to be shining because we don't want people to run into the rocks, so to speak. If you'll turn to your first page, here's our introduction. You can follow along as I read. The directive begins for the believer with the last command of our Lord from Matthew's letter. Having gone, then disciple all nations, baptizing them to the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all whatever I did command you. And lo, I am with you all the days till the full end of the age. He passes this on to his followers after he reminds them that he has the authority he shared the message and that he would be with us in this endeavor. Did that sink in yet? Those capital H-E's there? 
having the full confidence in him, we should not hesitate to obey this command. God reminded the Israelites that he would go before and fight for them as they went to conquer the promised land. We find that in Deuteronomy 1.30. If the Lord goes before you, he will be with you and not leave you or forsake you. So the response to that is, do not fear or dismay. Deuteronomy 31.8. Do you think fear is, an, is a uh, roadblock to sharing your faith? That's, that's the number one thing. And, and so that's where I'm starting out here in the introduction. We really don't have any reason to fear. No reason to fear if we recognize that he is always with us. So fear is the number one reason that believers do not share their faith. Whether rejection, persecution, hatred, lack of knowledge, or any number of other reasons, sharing the gospel paralyzes many Christians through fear. When the Almighty goes before us, we have no need to fear. Look at these reminders, Isaiah 52, 12. The Lord will go before you. Psalm 136, 16. He led his people, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Psalm 139, 5. You go before me and follow me. So, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is on our side. Amen? Isn't that great? As you begin the study, place your trust in the God that goes before you and upholds you. And I want you to do this. I want you, as, uh, as soon as we get done with this paragraph, pray right now that he will give you the peace, courage, and comfort of knowing that you represent him. Ask for his blessing as you prepare to equip yourself for the road ahead. Study to show yourself an approved workman. Be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. And remember, they may reject the message but the messenger will be found faithful for completing the task. So would you take just a moment right now and pray? Yes, Natalie? I want to say the older you get, the less fear you have. That may be true. Amazing. That's good. That's good. Take a moment right now and pray that God would give you the, the, uh, the peace and courage and comfort, knowing that you represent him and he's going to fight your battles for you. Ask for his blessing as you prepare yourself. Father, I do pray that you would encourage each of us, that you would strengthen us, that you would help us to know that we can share our faith and that it is a message worth giving. And there is a world out there that needs to know about our Savior. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Take a look down at the bottom of that first introduction page. You see three pictures. I would like to tell you that it is easier to share your faith in different parts of the world than it is in your backyard. It really is because you don't know those people and you may never meet them again. So the hardest battlefield you're going to find is the one that you're living in. Um, those are three pictures of places that I've gone on those mission trips and uh, shared the gospel. The first one, that little city with all the, the tiled roofs there, that is in uh, the Czech Republic. That's Ches Chesky Krumlov. Almost got that out right. Um, beautiful little city, totally surrounded by uh, a river. Uh, part of it was uh, helped by man, but uh, and then they had big walls. Beautiful city. We went into that city, and uh, uh, I was with a group. Each of these is with a group called Singing Men of Texas, and uh, we'd go on a mission trip every couple of years, and. Uh, we happened to go to the Czech Republic, and uh, we'd go to the town centers, and we would uh, uh, divide up into little groups. Some of them would go out and hand out flyers and invite people to come to our concert that evening where they were going to receive the gospel. And uh, sometimes in handing those things out, people had questions for us, and we needed to be able to know how to share our faith. Um, a lot of people will come up to you in a foreign country because they want to practice their English. Um, 
And so it's, a, it's an open door to be able to share your faith. I'll give you some uh, little insights into how you can share your faith through just casual conversations. Uh, the middle one is actually outside of a church in Xi'an, China. Uh, when we went to China, um, these people were so hungry for the Word of God that uh, even one lady who was in her early 90s biked, I'm saying a bicycle, 16 kilometers to come to the church to get there an hour early so that she could have a seat up front. Talk about devotion. Um, the next picture to the right, that's Salzburg, Germany. And uh, is Salzburg, Germany or Austria? I don't remember now. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Your mind just forgets those things. Anyway, that was Salzburg. And uh, we were there also. And we did the same type of thing. We'd go into the town centers and uh, uh, we would break up into little groups. Uh, some of the other groups, by the way, we had a uh, brass ensemble that would play uh, uh, jazz and, and different pop tunes and different things, you know, just to attract people. And uh, we had another one that was a, uh, a drum line, but they used uh, buckets and pails and different things, and they had uh, a regular routine with those. Um, we had another guy's quartet in another place uh, singing some songs. And so anything you can do to, uh, on these mission trips, attract people to be able to get them to come to the gospel concert. Um, that's what we would do. Well, anyway, those are, those are my reminders that the field is the world, the whole world. Now I would like you to take a quiz. <laughs> you didn't think you were going to get off easy, did you? Come on. If you do not have a pen, we have some up here in the front. And I'm tethered to this thing, so I can't get one for you. But you're welcome to help yourself. But I want you to take this salvation quiz. All the answers are true or false. You can just mark them with a T or an F. Go all the way from number 1 through 15, and I'll give you about five minutes. All right, let's look at our answers. If you haven't finished, you can cheat with the rest of us and, and finish it with us. Question number one, our salvation can be assured when we come from a strong family of faith. False. False. Doesn't matter if your father was Billy Graham. That's not the ticket to get into heaven. Okay, so family is not the key. Number two, when we grow up in a Bible-believing church, we can be sure that heaven is our destiny. False. It's not the membership that gets you into heaven. Number three, my work for the Lord will lead to my salvation. What would you answer from the scriptures on that one? Mm -hmm. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of our spirit. So it's God who does the work. He says, I am the That's true. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So we cannot work our way to heaven. Number four, I do not need to ask God for my salvation since I am already predestined by him. That if, the, that if you confess with your mouth, uh, there is an action, there is a choice. God created us with the ability to choose. That's why Adam and Eve fell. They made a choice. It was the wrong one, but they made a choice. Number five, if I obey the Ten Commandments, the Lord will grant me entry to heaven. Well, first off, you're not going to be able to do it. And secondly, that's not the ticket to heaven. In fact, Hebrews reminds us that the uh, law was given to prove that we, we couldn't make it into heaven. So it wasn't a ticket. Number six, God will certainly allow good moral people to eventually enter heaven. It's not how good or bad you are. It's not a scale. Okay, number seven, I can be sorry for my sin and God will give me salvation. Mm -hmm. Number eight, I need to give up all of my bad habits before I can be saved. Come just as you are. Number nine, God will not, 
Number nine, God will not accept someone who has done as many bad things as I have. Mm -hmm. Well, when you compare yourself to Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, he went around having people murdered. I mean, he was so zealous for the Old Testament law that he would kill Christians. Um, look at King David. He was adulterous. He didn't uh, do the things that God wanted him to do all the time. Uh, Case in point, when Jacob was talking about the ark falling off that cart, how was the ark supposed to be transported? The Kohathites were supposed to put them on poles on their shoulders, and that's the only way it was supposed to be taken, not on a cart. It doesn't matter whether the cart was new or old. And you know what? David gave that order. David also killed Uriah the Hittite by sending him to the front lines to be killed. We think we're bad. Is David suffering in hell today? No, he's not. He was a man after God's own heart. Isn't that amazing? Number 10, the way of salvation has one direction, but many different paths. That is the heart cry of the world today. You've got your faith. I've got mine. We'll all get there. Leave me alone. That's the mindset today. Number 11, heaven is a free gift from God. Is it a trick question? It is heaven a free gift? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. So it's true. But we didn't ask any of that. Heaven is a free gift. That's true. Number 12, I cannot earn, nor do I deserve heaven. True. That is true. Boy, you guys were loud on that one. <laughs> that was great. Number 13, if I believe in God, I will go to heaven. There's a verse in the New Testament that says the devil believes and trembles. He ain't going there. <laughs> Number 14, the book of Acts says that only the apostles were spread abroad to share the gospel. So it wasn't just go ye 12 into all the world. It was all of us, wasn't it? Number 15, I love this one. Bashful people cannot be expected to be soul winners. <laughs> How many times have we come up with an excuse? Well, I can't do that because I'm this way, you know, <laughs> in life. You hear people doing that all the time. Well, I'll give you all a 100 on that, whether you got it or not. You get a 100 because now you have all the correct answers. We're going to talk about that heaven is a free gift, by the way, when we talk about different methods of sharing our faith. So we'll, we'll catch that. Um, before you get too far past that, I had two more pictures for you uh, with verses. The first one is a, um, a vacation Bible school that we would run down in Acuna, Mexico on mission trips down there from our church uh, when we lived in Texas. And uh, these little kids... Uh, would just love all the attention that they could get. I mean, anything you could give them. And basically what we went down there to do is to build like a storage shed, which was basically a new home for their family. And uh, I mean, that's it. Uh, it. It didn't have indoor plumbing or anything. It was just a place to live, etc. you know? But it was better than the pieces of wooden pallet, two by four, tar paper that had blown off somebody else's house, you know, that they just put together around bushes and sit in there. And you know what? Even though that was the way they were living, we would go there in the morning and they'd have brooms and they were sweeping the dust. Can you imagine? They, they want to take care of what they do have. And uh, so we worked with another church down there to help them uh, to build some houses for the, for the ones who were active in the church and very faithful. The picture beside that was a, fa uh, a fella I talked to in uh, the Czech Republic. In fact, he was in, in Prague. And uh, uh, he had this little shop 
and I had to go in there and buy batteries for my camera uh, flash. And so I started up a conversation with him, invited him to our concert. He said he would come. I don't know if he ever came or not, but I told him we were there to tell good news. And, uh, uh, you know, we were going to be singing a bunch of songs and, and he liked music. And, and I told him, uh, pay close attention to the good news. And he said, what is the good news? I said, God has a message for us that's a good thing. And I want you to hear what it is. And uh, so whether he came or not, I don't know. But sow the seed wherever you can. Sow it wherever you can. All right. Getting started with evangelism. How to share your faith. These are the great questions of evangelism. Who? It's for all believers. That's your first blank spot there. Who is evangelism for? It's for all believers, not just the apostles. It's not just for pastors. It's not just for missionaries. What is evangelism? It's the gospel. Does everybody know what the gospel is? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The gospel in a nutshell. That according to the scriptures, Jesus Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again. That's the gospel in a nutshell. 1 Corinthians 15. Where? Evangelism is the world. Everywhere. It is. It's everywhere. I mentioned this at the outset. When? Now is the time. Here's the question. Why? Because it has the power to save it's not you that has any power to save anyone else. The gospel combined with the Holy Spirit of God has the power to save souls. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The Holy Spirit comes in and dwells within us. So we take the Holy Spirit with us wherever we go. And he's the one who has the power to convert people's hearts and minds. So when we take him with us and we take the gospel, the truth of God's word with us, those two things are what can save a person's soul. So again, realize that you're just the caretaker taking the message. If they reject you, it's because they're rejecting the message usually. And we have nothing to be ashamed about that. How can we do this? There are many methods, many methods. We'll look at a few of them today. But first, you need to know what you believe. Let me use an illustration here. Um, how many of you know uh, Oris Graham from our church? Um, my father-in-law. He had a stove and fireplace business back up in New York where we were from. And uh, after I graduated from college, I worked part-time as the uh, uh, music director at the church, part-time as the music teacher for the Christian Academy there, and then full-time for Oris at the um, stove and fireplace business. I was his showroom manager. Um, I learned really quick that I have to qualify the people that come through the door. I have to find out whether they're window shoppers or buyers, just from looking at them. So I had to learn how to do that. And then I had to know the product in order to be able to talk those people into improving their lives with my product. Now I had to know those things inside and out. For instance, the zero clearance fireplace unit in the corner of our showroom that was always going, even in the middle of the summer, um, had absolutely no fans in it, but it had two register grates above the fire pit down below, and we put little pieces of um, tissue paper on there that were going like this, and people would go, those are the quietest fans I've ever heard. There's no fans. There's no electricity. You don't need any electricity for this. Really? Yeah. I had to know those things. I also had to know that it put out 42,000 BTUs of heat, enough to fill up 1,600 square feet of a house. So one unit could heat 1,600 square feet. 
Now that's important to people, they need to know. Now if they have an upstairs, maybe they need something else upstairs too. But I had to know all those different things. You have to know what you believe in order to be able to talk to somebody else. Do you agree? Okay. I can't sit here and talk about the Cardinals as well as Pete can because I'm a Dodger fan. I can talk about the Dodgers till I'm blue in the face and it would be Dodger blue, by the way. But still, um, you have to know what you believe in order to be able to communicate. Second, can you all, can you yes, you sure can. I know all of his stories. <laughs> Go ahead. Mm-hmm. And the cops in the neighborhood knew him, and they knew that he was helping his father out. So they, you know, he had to be, what, 16 to drive? Mm-hmm. He was only 12. Right. So he was able to help his father out by delivering the call. Mm-hmm. And all the jobs that Oris ever had, he was the hardest worker that I ever heard of. Mm-hmm. And it's sad to know what's happening to him today. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you probably heard that story. Oh, many times. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Isn't it sad how our bodies can wear out? If we could only be young, but then we'd never enter into eternity, right? So there's a reason for this. Okay, secondly, you need to understand your audience. Understand your audience. When you're talking to someone, you need to know as much about them as possible. Um, if it's going to be a fleeting time, um, Find out something about them and, and try and utilize that in your conversation to steer them into a spiritual conversation. And again, I'll, I'll get to a place where we can uh, practice that and I'll show you a few examples. But understand your audience. Number three or third, know how to connect the two. You have to be able to take what you believe and knowing your audience, give it to them in a manner that they will understand. Now, if I probably had not been uh, doing music in churches my whole life, I think my second choice would have been children's ministry because I love talking to kids because I can be a kid and I know how to talk kiddies. Okay. And so, uh, I understand my audience and I know how to speak to them on their level. And uh, uh, Donna puts up with it. You know, she, uh, she understands who I am and she married me anyway, but still. Um, you have to know your audience and know what you believe to be able to communicate that effectively. So you have to connect the two. Here's a good statistic for you. 48% of Americans are what we would call post-Christian, according to a survey, by the Barna Group. Have you ever heard of the Barna Surveys? No. That name? George Barna. He was a guy who started a business, a Christian man who started a business of uh, facts and figures and percentages. And he would do all kinds of things. Um, you're familiar with polls, of course, right? Well, he took polls of just about anything you could think of, and uh, a lot of them were in the line of Christianity. And look at what it says here about post-Christians. A post-Christian society is not merely a society in which agnosticism or atheism is the prevailing fundamental belief. Because you would think that a post-Christian mindset then uh, would have to be in a country that is anti-God or doesn't believe in a God. But that's not true. It is a society rooted in the history, culture, and practices of Christianity but in which the religious beliefs of Christianity have been either rejected or worse, forgotten. Rejected or worse, forgotten. 48% of Americans are post-Christian. That's half of our country. Here's one of these research things I was telling you about. None equals re- religiously unaffiliated. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to travel through this section just a little bit quicker because I want to get to the meat and bones of why you're really here. 
but nuns equals religiously unaffiliated. Nearly 25% of Americans and young Americans um, are more likely to be a nun. And that's not N-U-N, that's N-O-N-E. They're not religiously uh, affiliated anywhere. Millennials, 44% of them are nuns. That's my kids. All three of my boys are millennials. 72% of nuns say the scriptures are not the word of God. This is America we're talking about, and these are the people you're going to be meeting. In 2016, the Barna Group came up with this. 22% of Americans do not believe the Bible has any divine underpinnings. 27% of millennial non-Christians believe the Bible is a dangerous book of religious dogma used for centuries to oppress people. Have you heard that lately? There's some pretty popular groups that have risen up in the last couple of years, and this is their mantra. So, you want a revival? Start assuming there are post-Christian people in the room. All the rooms. Begin evaluating through the eyes and ears of post-Christians. The people that you walk up to, one of every two are going to have this post-Christian mindset. Okay, You've got to figure out how you can still talk to them. Appealing to post-Christian people on the basis of the authority of Scripture has essentially the same effect as a Muslim imam appealing to you on the basis of the authority of the Quran. Have you ever thought about that? If, if a Muslim came up to you and says, well, the Quran says this, how much weight does that carry with you? Zero. So if you go to a post-Christian and you tell them, but the Bible says this, how much emphasis does that have with them? Same. How do we get around that? Andy Stanley has an interesting little book called Why the Bible Says So Isn't Enough Anymore. Um, let me water this down for you just a, li a little. Basically speaking, you, you don't take the Bible to them, a post-Christian person who denies that the Bible is God's Word, and you take that Bible story to them and you relate to them actual factual history. history. For instance, there was a guy by the name of Matthew. There's indisputable evidence that there was a Matthew who was a tax collector who met a teacher called Jesus Christ. And you can tell Matthew's story because Matthew wrote it out for us. So you can talk about a person who knows Jesus Christ and then relate Jesus Christ to them from a historical perspective and you're actually giving them the Bible and they don't know it. There are ways to be able to still tell other people. Basically, atheism says that no God exists. I want to get these two words to you, agnosticism and atheism. Uh, agnost um, agnostics, basically, they don't know if a God really exists or not, but they're, they're not signed up. Uh, but atheism, no God exists. If it is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle, an atheist will have an even harder time. Second paragraph, if man is the pinnacle, P-I-N-N-A-C-L-E, if man is the pinnacle of all that there is, and we are here merely by chance or fate, then there is no purpose in life other than getting all that you can to satisfy you for as long as it can while trying to stave off death as long as you can. Does that sound promising to you? Last paragraph, try and approach a sense of morality. Most people think that they have some kind of a moral basis in their lives. Morality has to be based on something, and it traced back to the Bible and Judeo-Christian ethics. That may be a basis for then sharing a life of purpose, 
built upon following the creator of those ideals. Again, why does our legal system have the laws that it has? A lot of those are based on things that we found in the scriptures. So because of that, we can go back to the scriptures were written by different men as they were moved along by the spirit of God, the creator, the one who gave us all those different things. And that's where our basis is from. So you can then start a question with them. Yes, Natalie. Um, exactly like I had mentioned before. Talk about Matthew. Talk about John. You can also talk about look around today. It's 3,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. I said this, was, this is what we'd be like. Mm -hmm. Yep. I carry a bunch of tracks in my purse and I give them out. That's great. I mean, people have been doing that for generations, giving out tracks. As a kid, I always loved those chick tracks because they were cartoons. <laughs> I always loved those. You know what? They're really effective. Oh, they are. Mm -hmm. Turn to the next page, some methods. Let's look at some methods. You may have a tried and true method for witnessing to other people, and it may or may not be one of these four different things. But I'm going to give you these four as examples. There are plenty of others out there that you can utilize. But uh, these are methods I'm familiar with that I think are very effective. The first one, you've probably heard this before, the Romans Road. This is a biblical walk laid out by the greatest of the apostles. It introduces sin, its results, an alternative ending, a sacrificial gift, an offer, and a result worth pursuing. It's a great story. If a person is not opposed to you opening up your Bible and walking them through it, this is a good one right here, the Romans road. Follow it along. Romans 3, 10 and 23, no one is right with God for all have sinned. Well, that's a problem. 623a says the penalty for sin is death. That's a big problem, right? Well, 23b says life is offered through God's gift. Oh, really? Okay. 5.8 says God loves us and offers us this gift. 10.13 goes on to say that anyone can accept the gift and live. 10.9 says if you act, then there's a reward. 12.1 and 2 tells us your reasonable result is to embrace God and this new life. That's the Romans road boiled down into easy little bite-sized nuggets right there. Um, I don't know if you're like me. I took my Bible and I always knew Romans 3.10 was the first one. And then I put down the reference for the next one right next to 3.10. And then I went to 3.23 and wrote down the reference to the next one. Then I went to 6. And, you know, I, I just, just in case, you know, you get caught up under the pressure and you go, oh, what was that verse? Was that? Um, that helped me out. How many of you have ever been exposed to Evangelism Explosion, D. James Kennedy? Coral Ridge Ministries. I took the uh, baptistified version of that um, for two weeks out in Elkhart, Indiana. When I was traveling for Baptist Bible College uh, in a musical team, we had to go to summer camps all summer long and different churches every weekend. And uh, so uh, we needed to know how to share our faith. And uh, so the beginning part of that was to go there for a two week intensive on evangelism explosion. And Evangelism Explosion uh, is very effective in this. It's presented out of a desire for heaven. If somebody hates this world and is willing to believe that there is a better place, this might be a great effective tool to use. Okay? There's two questions that bring the conversation to an outline that leads to eternal life in heaven. Now, here's the two questions. And you can ask these questions to anybody. Have you come to a place in your spiritual life where you know for certain that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven. You may get an answer. You may not. But most of the time, people will say, well, I hope so or I think so. Yeah, that's, that's the prominent answer. Number two, well, suppose that you were to die tonight. I'm not saying you're going to, okay? But suppose you were to die tonight and stand before God and he were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? 
what would you say? Nine times out of 10, well, I, I was a pretty good person. I was better than my next door neighbor. I gave it to my church. I, I did this. I did that. I, 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 I is right, right? <laughs> so we have this little equation that's uh, given after this, this little outline, five different things you can tell them after you've asked them those two questions. Well, would you like to know for sure is the lead in to these five different things? You talk about grace, man, God, Christ, and faith. The grace is that heaven is a free gift. Now, we talked about this earlier. Remember that? Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift. It's a gift. It's a free gift. Since it is free, it cannot be earned or deserved. For instance, if I were to give you this pen, and you were to give me a $5 bill out of gratitude, would that be a free pen? If I tried to give you this pen and you said, that is so nice, let me wash your car. By the way, you can if you want. Um, <laughs> would it be a free gift? No. no. A free gift can't be earned or even deserved. Don didn't do anything to deserve this beautiful pen, which you can have it if you want. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, it can't be earned or deserved. Proverbs 14, 12. Would somebody look that scripture up for us? Because this is a good one we want to hang on to. This is one that if you don't already know it, this is one I suggest you add to your database in your brain. Okay? Proverbs 14, 12. As soon as somebody gets it, go ahead and read it out loud. Mm hmm. Well, there's a free gift. You can't earn it or deserve it because you know what? Your best effort leads to death. Nowhere. There's a way which seems right. And you might think you're right. But the end is going to lead you to death and destruction. There's only one way. It's God's way. And it's Jesus. That was a song, by the way. I, I had to throw that in since I'm a music guy. All right. You've talked about grace. Um, then you talk about man. We know that there's, there's a free gift that's being offered to us. Well, let's look at man. First of all, man is a sinner. We all know that. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You can even use the little, little illustration that uh, none of us is perfect. In fact, if you sinned, let's say, three times a day, uh, there's sins of commission, things that you did wrong, sins of omission, things you didn't do that you should have done. Okay? We all know that we're supposed to share the gospel and maybe... We felt like we should have talked to that person. We didn't. That could have been a sin. Oh, no. Um, so just three a day. I mean, that's not much, right? Well, seven times three is 21, right? So if you've gone a whole week, you've, com you've committed 21 sins. Well, let's multiply that by 52 now and go a whole year with just three sins a day. You're getting up there. Now multiply that by at least 60 years, because all of us have probably gotten to 60 by now, right? Um, that's a lot of sins. How close is that to perfect? Right? Nowhere near. None of us is perfect. Man is a sinner. And Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 tells us he cannot save himself. It's by grace we are saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. Again, it points back to that first one under grace. It's a gift from God. Well, we've talked about the gift. We've talked about man. Now let's talk about God. God is merciful. You know, people need to hear that. Uh, he doesn't want to punish us. John 3, 16. God loved the world so much he gave his only son. Right? But take a coin. You flip it up in the air. You're either going to get what? Heads or tails. God is kind of like that coin in this illustration. He loves us. He doesn't want to punish us. But he's also just. And he can't pass over the sin. Therefore, he must punish sin. Exodus 34, 7b says, He will by no means clear the guilty. That's a frightening thought, isn't it? And all of us, since we've all sinned, stand before God as guilty. 
There has to be something then that can change our situation in standing before God. Well, let's talk about Christ. That's the next part. Christ, who he is. He's the infinite God man. You know, he came down. John 1, 1 tells us in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. For, verse 14 says, says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the father. So Jesus Christ came down to show us the father. So that's who he is. And what did he do? He paid for our sins and purchased a place in heaven for which he offers as a gift. You all know that great Isaiah 53 passage. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his stripes we are healed. So he paid the price for us. Which leads us to how do, how do we embrace this? It's by faith. Grace, man, God, Christ, faith. What it is not. Faith is not mere intellectual assent or temporal faith. That's that James 2.19 verse that I mentioned earlier. The devil believes and trembles. Okay? So it's not just head knowledge that gets you into heaven. What it is, it's trusting in Christ alone for our salvation. It's placing yourself firmly in his control and leading. John 1.12, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. So the qualifying question after that says, does this make sense to you? If not, you can go through those five steps uh, individually. Maybe one of those you know, was a hang up for them. And then the commitment question, would you like to receive that gift of eternal life? So if somebody's looking for heaven, this is a great model to use. Yes, ma'am. Um, I would share one thing, and I, I personally have preferred the first one. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And we had in the language one Portuguese and one was Spanish, whatever it was. Uh -huh. And we would just hold up this track, you know, and it, it said, what is the big question? And it was this question. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to say, more people stayed and listened than those that walked away. And the highlight of the trip, and it didn't, I didn't have the blessing, another man did, mm -hmm. and interpreters, there was a young man that did this. Come to find out he was a leader of a gang of 12-year-old boys. Hmm. He came to Christ that day and wanted to know how he, what church was, was local, because he mm -hmm. was going to be leaving, right. that he could take his boys there. That's great. That's awesome. That mm -hmm. Sometimes the, the, the smallest step can be huge. It can be huge. Let's look at another one. This one is uh, put out by uh, Good Seed or Good Soil Ministry, um, which is actually identified with the GRBC churches, one that we're tied into, okay, out of regular Baptist Press. The Chronological Bridge to Life. Let me see here. Um, am I still showing up? I probably took too long. Let me try and. Uh, uh, nope, not that one. Uh, what page are you on? Oh, okay, I see it. Okay. Um, there we go, screen mirroring. Let's see if it turns on this time. I want to be able to show you this chronological bridge to life because they do have an app that is free that you can download and use this. Okay, it says I'm tied in, so I just got to make... Ooh, boy, that could have been trouble. Said it was a smart TV. <laughs> but you left just short. Yes, it is. That is an actual picture my son took. Uh -huh. 
he was he was by the hole and he was going to get it going in the hole and I missed. So I saved it anyway. Okay, here we go. Let me see. Church. Um, here we go. The chronological bridge to life. Here we go. Uh, if you can't see that over there, you, you may just want to take a quick peek over here. But the chronological bridge to life, you've got the outline here on your paper. But look at the little uh, illustrations. God, man, sin, death, Christ, cross, faith, and life. These are eight essential truths that emerge out of the Bible's redemptive story in this chronological order. So it's telling the story of the Bible chronologically as a historical happening. Okay? Again, some of these post-Christian people don't want to hear about the Bible as being the authoritative Word of God. Well, you can tell them a story, um, and I'm going to get into this in just a, a minute. You need to be able to tell your story. So in order for you to tell your story, what would it be appropriate for you to do with the person you're talking to? Ask them their story first. Doesn't that make sense? I'll get into that, and, but you're going to be telling your story. So if, if you've listened to their story and they haven't run away yet, um, you can tell them your story. And th this is what I believe. So they don't have to shut down the Bible because they're listening to your story. Okay? Uh, in the chronological bridge to life. Basically, God, man, sin, death, Christ, cross, faith, and life. Um, all of these things lead from creation to eternity. And uh, these different things, there is an intro, there's God. Again, this is all on an app. So if you have a phone, you can download the app and use it on your phone just like I'm using it on my iPad. Uh, any kind of tablet, you can just use these. After you're done talking about God, talk about man. And notice, this is what the Bible says. This is, this is what I have done out of faith in response to this knowledge. This, this is where I am. So I'm still telling my story. Sin, what the Bible says, my response. Death, Christ, cross, faith, life. And then, can you say that you are now trusting Jesus Christ? Um, what you have done at the end of that is, from the Bible we learn that Jesus alone, do you believe this? See that last question, do you believe this? And if you say you believe this, then, uh, you know, let me, let me pray with you and encourage you and tell you the next steps, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if not, bring it down. What's stopping you from accepting this? Okay? So, again, the chronological bridge to life is a great tool to use. It's colorful. It's pretty. And it's all done for you. You don't have to be super smart. That's why I like it. <laughs> but let me show you one more that I, I just really like. Um, the Story of Hope, you go to your app store, whether it's Google Play or, or whether it's uh, uh, the app store from iTunes or, or Apple. I, um, you just, like, like you said, you have an iPad. Mm -hmm. you Yeah, if you were to go to, uh, let me see. Um, I just put in Story of um, Hope app. Oh, well, wait a minute. You don't, you don't want to. You don't want to do that? No, you want to go to your app store. There you go. Go to your app store. So I'm, I'm in my app store, mm -hmm. and I'm going to search for... Chronological bridge to life. And it didn't come up under that one. I think it comes up under um, good soil. Nope. Um, what was the other one? Story of hope. Mm -hmm. 
There it is, the story of hope condensed. It's this one right here, the purplish one. That little icon that has the word hope right in the middle of it with an open Bible, that's, that's the one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking that, Natalie. That was good. Well, it depends on how much time you have with a person. If you, does anybody know what, what it means to go into all the world and make disciples? How much time does it take to make a disciple? When we talk about sharing your story or sharing your faith, making a disciple is a longer process. This is perfect for making a disciple um, because there are more tools involved in it that you can use after you've led them through those eight different things. So if you've got, if you've got 20 minutes with a person, you can easily go through all these in 20 minutes. So, yes, ma'am. I don't think they've produced any tracts, no, no. Let, let me show you this particular one. This one's called Life on Mission. And again, this is another app that you can download. Yeah, I've got a good one that says, how do you get to heaven from Florida? I know, I've seen that one. <laughs> what was the name of the one you just said? Life on Mission. Why do I like this one, Natalie? What? I said, why do I like this one? Well, yeah. Because it's easy and fast. Yeah. Well, you know, um, how many times are you going to get somebody to talk to you for 20 minutes? Oh, believe me, I can, I can talk to people for a long time. I'm just a late person. We'll practice, Natalie. No, because they're there to get a job done. That may not be the best situation. Oh, okay. Again, they've got another appointment. They're leaving. <laughs> uh -huh. it's, it's, it goes all the way back to the showroom. Qualify the person coming through the door. Have I got time to you know, carry on a conversation? If you don't have a time to carry on a conversation because they're trying to get to the next job, you can say, I appreciate the skills that God gave you. Thank you so much for helping me out. If there's anything I can ever do for you, uh, let me know. And I'm going to be praying for you because I believe God has something good for you. Plant the seed. I have the Ten Commandments written on the side of my house. And they always stop and look at them. They probably wonder, why aren't those in school anymore? <laughs> Let me, for time's sake, let me get to this last one, Life on Mission, the three circles. I really like this one because it's fast, it's easy, you don't need the app. If you have a piece of paper, a napkin in a restaurant, anything to write on, you can do this. Now, if you don't have a pen, you'll have to write in blood, I'm sorry. But still, um, ask your waiter, waiter or waitress for a pen. The three circles. Three circles is a simple way to have gospel conversations as you tap through the slides, you'll see how God has organized the world to work, what's gone wrong, and how we can respond to Him. This is a perfect one for today's mindset. This world is a mess. Amen? Amen. Yeah. It wasn't meant to be that way. Let me tell you about it. Okay? There was God's design. That's the first circle you draw on your paper. God's design. What was God's design? We see beauty, purpose, and evidence of God's design around us. This didn't just happen by chance around us, okay? This didn't just evolve. Tell me a Rolex watch just evolved on my wrist, and then I'll be on your side, okay? You know it didn't happen that way. This was created. There was intelligent design in everything around us, okay? God designed it beautifully. The Bible tells us that God originally planned a world that worked perfectly, where everything and everyone fit together in harmony. God made each of us with a purpose to worship Him and walk with Him. That was the design. You know what? There's an arrow. That little three-letter word over there is sin. 
Life doesn't work when we ignore God and his original design for our lives. Adam and Eve ignored God, and it was called sin. We selfishly insist on doing things our own way. The Bible calls this sin. We all sin and distort the original design. So the consequence of our sin is separation from God. We were supposed to be close to him, but now we're separated from him in this life and for all eternity. By the way, the Bible, there are Bible verses underneath all of these that, that go along with them. Well, what happens now we have the second circle, which is where we have found ourselves because of sin. We're in brokenness. And see all those little squiggly lines going out? It doesn't matter what you want to put on each of those lines. It's like Isaiah 53 says, we've all gone our own way. We've all gone astray. All kinds of brokenness. Whether you want to dare to say to somebody homosexuality, uh, abortion, uh, euthanasia, um, murder, uh, drug abuse, you know, whatever you want to put in those little squiggly lines, they're all results of brokenness because of sin. Well, God gave us that third circle, and that's called the gospel. And the gospel is this. It's a remedy. It's a remedy. It's, it's good news. Because of his love, God did not leave us in our brokenness. Jesus, God in human flesh, came to us and lived perfectly according to the design. He died to take our punishment, to take our place. He was buried and he rose again and he lives today. And so that is the gospel. All we need to do is say, okay, I don't want brokenness anymore. I'm going to repent from that and accept what God has offered to me. And I'm going to believe that. Believe in the gospel. Then that allows us to be able to recover and pursue God in his original intent, that we would walk with him and fellowship with him and follow him. We don't do that face to face like they did in the garden, but we do it by faith today. That's the three circles. Well, what should I do now? Now that you've heard this good news, God wants you to respond to him. You can talk to him and tell him, you know, hey, I, I realize I, I have sinned and I'm in brokenness. And thank you for sending your son so that I can chase you again. Okay. Uh, so again, it's a, it's a very easy little, well, I should probably leave that up. It's a very easy little thing to use. And again, uh, you don't need the app, but that's available in the App Store too. Life on Mission. What I like about it also is that it also helps us with these next questions. It says on the bottom of that last page, what's next? Prayer, God wants to talk to you. Church, you need to find other people who are in touch with God also and uh, you know, learn from each other. The Bible, the Bible reveals that original design and where we can go to keep good communication with him, showing us how to pursue him. And then share, you need to tell somebody else about this good story. So that leads to that. Now, here's the hardest part. How do you start talking to somebody? Well, let me give you one illustration here. I'm going to have to go over here on this side. There we go. One of the pastors I worked with flies to a lot of different places. Anybody like to fly? Okay. You're on an airplane. You may be sitting next to somebody you don't know. What does he always do? He carries one of these with him. Not, not this big, a little bit smaller, but he always carries a Bible with him. And uh, he'll sit down and before the plane even starts to take off, when he's all settled in his seat, he'll, he'll turn to something. Usually he's preparing for a sermon or something like that. So he's not just casually reading, but uh, he's, he's in the Word. Well, you know the person next to you is going to be doing this. They're going to notice that you're reading something. And nine times out of ten, it's not Grisham novels, you know. It's, it's, it's a Bible that that, that person is, is reading right there. And uh, they realize that. And, you know, if, if, they, don't, if they don't believe, they, they kind of tense up, you know. And he says he can tell from their body language whether they're going to be open to what I'm reading 
or whether that's something that's a barrier in their lives. Well, as the plane takes off, he'll introduce himself. Hi, I'm so-and-so. Um, what is your name? Usually they'll respond. Um, oh, are you heading to home or, or away? You know, just casual conversation. You can start up a casual conversation with anybody, right? And then he'll, uh, in a very short time, try and find something in common with that person, whether it be children, grandchildren, uh, spouses, work, whatever, uh, uh, common hobbies, et cetera, et cetera. And once you then talk about those commonalities, then he'll drop the bomb. So tell me your story. He didn't say anything spiritual, but he said, tell me your story. That person is going to then share the most prominent thing on their minds about themselves at that particular point in time. It's probably not going to be spiritual in nature, but he's going to tell, they're going to tell him their story. And when they're finished, he's going to say, that's, that's really a great story. Let me share, you, share with you my story. Now, you may not believe some of the things I'm about to tell you, but I'm going to tell you about my story. I was a farmer, and he tells his story about how he was a farmer on a tractor, and that's all he ever wanted to do until he had a come-to-Jesus meeting uh, one day and realized that God was calling him into the ministry. Uh, so, you know, he uses that story, in, in, and uh, he, he uses that to tell his story. But in that process, he talks about a God who created this world and means a lot to him, a God who demonstrated a love for him in giving him his son, and somebody that he could look up to, Jesus Christ was somebody he could look up to and admire, and the thing about it is, is once he established a relationship with him, he could feel it in his heart that he was a different person. He was changed. He had a hope and a peace that he'd never had before. And that usually hooks the person next to you because this world doesn't know hope or peace, do they? So the first thing I want to leave you with here before we leave is know your story. We need to know three different things. Who I was before I met Jesus. Your story is who I was before I met Jesus. How I met Jesus is the second one. Who I was before I met Jesus, how I met Jesus, who I am now that I met Jesus. That's your story. For me, who I was before I met Jesus, I was a little runt running around, having a good time. I was about five years old. My brother came home from his very first summer camp. He went to a Bible camp that our church was sponsoring, and he went and he came back. And my mom came into our bedroom. We shared the same bedroom. I had my little bed here. He had his bed there, you know, and, and uh, we both sat on our beds. And my mom pulled up a chair and she sat down and asked Steve, that's my brother, um, asked him about uh, camp and how he enjoyed camp. And Steve began to tell her about all the different things that he liked about camp. And in the process, he told her about the mission story. Um, and about the Bible story about Jesus and so forth and so on. And so as he was recounting that, my mom said yes, and she started to again share the story of Jesus, how God sent Jesus to save us from our sins so that we could go to heaven. And she said to Steve, she said, um, um, now, do you, do you understand that? He says, I think I do. And she says, do you want to make that decision right now? And he said, maybe not yet. And little Neil over on his bunk said, I do. So that's who I was before I met Jesus. That's how I met Jesus. And ever since then, I have failed miserably at being a perfect follower of Jesus Christ. But I am striving every single day to do the best that I can to honor and glorify Him because He did everything for me. Did your brother ever accept Oh, yes, he did. I think he was probably, let's see, five, nine, probably in a couple of years. It was probably a couple of years later. He had gone to camp. My grandma and grandpa, they sent us both off to summer camp every year. That was so nice of them. So if you have grandchildren, send them to camp. Okay. <laughs> it was great. But again, who I was before I met Jesus, how I met Jesus, and who I am since. And that's not a long story. 
doesn't take long. Again, knowledge is key. If you don't know all of the verses you think you should know, fear not, I am with thee, God says. Most of the verses that I can pull up from memory are the ones that I learned when I was a junior astronaut in children's church growing up. Um, it's not the ones I'm memorizing right now. It's the basis that was laid as a young child. And I shouldn't be able to remember those, but you know what? It's the Holy Spirit who does help me remember those. And I can pull those out. But you can even use just one verse that the whole world knows to be able to tell somebody else. John 3, 16. That God, there's somebody else besides me. God loved. This world doesn't know what real love is about. This I'm talking about is real love. God loved the world. He created this world so much that he gave us a gift, his son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him won't have to perish and be separated from God, but will have life everlasting with him. That's the only verse you really need to know. All the other ones are blessings on top. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Just remember that it all hits them from three from three, and then B is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. However, we went on to say and that He is living today. He was resurrected. We, I mean, we, I'm in the interest of time, I'm doing this very quickly. And then C was confession. Mm -hmm. Romans ten nine and ten. So it's admit, believe, and confess. Working in Southern Baptist churches for twenty years, I really enjoyed. Vacation Bible School, every year the ABC song. A, admit to God you are a sinner. B, believe that Jesus died and rose again. C, confess your, uh, confess, with, uh, confess your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone and he will save you. Um, that was the message out of every Vacation Bible School, ABC. And the kids would learn that in song with motions and everything else and it was great. But it's an easy way to share the gospel. I was raised Southern Baptist. Mm -hmm. Now, um, We've probably gone a little bit longer, but I want you to take a moment and I want you to turn to a person next to you and I want you just to take turns and practice asking their story and telling your story just very briefly, okay? Tell your story to each other right now, okay? And let me pray with you before you start that, okay? Let me pray with you because this ends the class and uh, this is just bonus time for you, okay? All right, let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to take the information that we received today and uh, it's all based on your word, Father. I pray that we would hide your word in our hearts, that we would not sin against you, that we would know it and be able to translate it to other people so that they might not sin against you, but above all, that we might be able to use it as the effective tool that it is, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to tell others about him so that they too might have eternal life in Jesus Christ. So, Father, help us to do everything that we can to make sure heaven is full. And Father, there's two people dying every second in this country. Help us to make our time um, something that is a priority, to take every advantage that you give us to tell others of Jesus Christ. And we pray it in his name. Amen.